Mr. Pascarell for 30 minutes. The gentleman's recognized. Mr. Speaker, in light of the upcoming one-on-one -on -one meeting between Donald Trump and President Trump and Vladimir Putin, I rise today to remind the American people about the cloud of collusion hanging over their heads. As the American people continue to learn details of this unfolding scandal, the implausible idea of Russia compromising the President of the United States becomes more fact than fiction. The President, his family members, his campaign staff, his close associates have repeatedly, repeatedly lied about their multiple contacts with Russian off officials and class associates of Putin. They have had no consistent explanation for these meetings. It has happened over and over. Furthermore, the President continues to parrot Putin's version of world events over those of his own American career civil servants, intelligence operatives, military officials and allies. This betrayal has become like clockwork, an inexplicable routine we cannot simply shrug off. While it is possible the current list of known campaign contacts, positive policy positions, and fawning statements have an innocuous explanation, there is a simpler reason the House should be investigating. Has President Donald Trump been covertly influenced or personally compromised by Russia, a hostile foreign power. Russian intelligence is known for using blackmail that exploits greed, stupidity, and ego, and other weaknesses to leverage over people. He has employed Mr. Michael Cohn, Mr. Felix Sater, the record is very clear on this, both of whom have links to the Russian mafia. He has continued the secrecy about his business finances by not releasing his tax returns. The ex ex ethics commissioner told the President of the United States to divest. He did not, and he defied that person most responsible for draining the swamp, the ethics commissioner. From operating his business at or beyond the edge of ethical boundaries, Trump's penchant for compromising behavior, his willingness to work closely with criminals, and expressed desire to protect his privacy makes him the ideal target. With close business ties, Russia has enjoyed financial leverage over President Trump for 15 years. This is a fact that his family has admitted to multiple times. The story is well known. After a series of brazen abuses of bankruptcy laws, President Trump was not president at the time. Mr. Trump found it impossible to borrow from American banks. So he turned to unconventional sources of capital, including Russian cash. From 2003 to 2017, people from the former Soviet Union made 86 all-cash purchases that we know of a known red flag of potential money laundering of Trump properties totaling $109 million. Russians make up a pretty disproportionate cross-section of a lot of our assets, quote-unquote. Those are the words of Donald Jr. in 2008. In 2010, the private wealth division of Deutsche Bank also loaned Trump, President Trump, hundreds of millions of dollars during the same period it was laundering billions in Russian money. We don't rely on American banks. We have all the funding we need out of Russia. Those are the boasts of Eric Trump in 2014. Shady business transactions offer the perfect cover for covert payments. And President Trump's adamant refusal to release his tax returns publicly only raises the level of suspicion. The idea that Russia has been cultivating, supporting, and assisting Donald Trump to undermine Western alliances should come as no surprise to anyone paying attention. Before enduring his campaign for president, Mr. Trump, there were several odd connections between the two men when they lied about to the public. As president, 
Mr. Trump, President Trump called Putin fine people. He ignored the fact that Putin invaded Crimea, intervened in eastern Ukraine, poisoned people in United Kingdom, and has commissioned the murder of dissidents, journalists, and spies, shot down a commercial airliner in Europe, and propped up most ruthless dictators of our time in Syria, and violated our sovereignty in 2016 presidential election by every, every intelligence organization that says USA. To ensure the American people and future Congresses know how we got here today, today I will read parts of the Trump-Russia dossier into the record. Also known as the Christopher Steele dossier and enter its entirety into the congressional record. Partisans on the other side of the aisle may dismiss the document as bogus, even fake news, but they know that several allegations in this document have already been verified. While the dossier represents raw intelligence, or effectively a first draft, not a single thing of substance has been disproven, not one. And Christopher Steele has reliably provided intelligence to the UK and US intelligence agencies for decades. While history will be the final judge on these matters, these are, the, are some of the allegations which we now have been verified. Madam Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, this is serious business. And when I read from the dossier, I'm reading from my prime source. What I read tonight has all been verified and certified, the, what, the stuff that I'm reading. While history will be a final judge on these matters, here are some of the allegations. Page one of the dossier, the claim, quote unquote, Russian regime has been cultivating, supporting, assisting Trump for five years, at least. AIM, endorsed by Putin, has been to encourage splits and divisions in the Western Alliance, in the Western Alliance. So far, the dossier reads, I continue, Mr. Trump has declined various sweetener real estate business deals offered him in Russia in order to further the Kremlin's cultivation of him. However, he and his inner circle have accepted a regular flow of intelligence from the Kremlin, including on his Democratic and other political rivals. Now, here's the truth. On January 6, 2017, intelligence community assessment released by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence stated that Russian leadership favored Trump's candidacy over Clinton's and that Putin personally ordered an influence campaign to harm Clinton's electoral chances and, quote, undermine public faith in the U.S. democratic process, as well as ordering cyber attacks on, quote unquote, both major U.S. political parties. Page seven in eight. I don't have time to read the whole thing tonight, obviously. Dossier claim on page seven and eight. The Russian regime, quote, has been behind the recent leak of embarrassing email messages emanating from the Democratic National Committee to the WikiLeaks platform. The reason for using WikiLeaks was plausible deniability, quote, unquote. And the operation had been conducted with full knowledge and support of President Trump and senior members of his campaign team. In return, the Trump team had agreed to sideline Russian intervention in Ukraine as a campaign issue and to raise U.S. NATO defense commitments in the Baltics and Eastern Europe to deflect attention away from Ukraine, a priority for Mr. Putin, who needed to characterize and cauterize the subject. This is what he wrote. That's on page seven and eight that the dossier claims. Now, here's the truth. In July 2016, the Republican National Convention made changes 
to the Republican Party's platform on Ukraine. Initially, the GOP platform proposed providing lethal weapons to the Ukraine, quote, unquote. That's what it originally stated, that platform. But the line was watered down to promise appropriate assistance, quote, unquote. NPR reported that Diana Denman, a Republican delegate who supported arming U.S. allies in Ukraine, has told people that Trump aide J.D. Gordon said at the Republican convention in 2016 that Trump directed him to support weakening that position in the official platform, unquote. J.D. Gordon, who is one of Trump's national security advisors during the campaign, said they had advocated for changing language because that reflected what Trump had said. The Trump campaign did not appear to have intervened in any other platform deliberations, only the language on Ukraine. And here's the truth. As the president and throughout the campaign, Donald Trump has called NATO obsolete, although he changed his mind today a little bit, championing the disintegration of the European Union, and said that he is open to lifting sanctions on Russia or has declined to enforce them. Trump has repeatedly questioned whether our allies are paying enough into NATO, ultimately raising questions as to whether he is deliberately facilitating Putin's long-term objective of undermining the Western liberal order. Dossier, page 30. Quote, speaking to a trusted compatriot in mid-October of 2015, a close associate of Rosneft President and Putin ally Igor Session, he, his, his name appears all over the place in the dossier, elaborated on the reported secret meeting between Mr. Session and Carter Page of the United States Republican Presidential Candidates Foreign Policy Team in Moscow in July of 2016. The secret had been confirmed to him or her by a senior member of the staff in addition to by Rosneft president himself. It took place on either the 7th or 8th of July, the same day or the one after Carter Page made a public speech to the higher economic school in Moscow, unquote. In terms of the, the substance of the discussion, Sessions, Mr. Sessions, associate said that Rosneft president was so keen to lift personal and corporate Western sanctions imposed on his company that he offered Page, Mr. Trump's associates as well, the brokerage of up to 19% privatized stake in Rosneft in return. Page had expressed interest and confirmed that were Trump elected U.S. president, sanctions on Russia would be lifted. The truth. On December the 29th, 2016, during the transition period between the election and the inauguration, National Security Advisor, designate Mike Flynn, spoke to Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislev, urging him not to retaliate for newly imposed sanctions. Ultimately, the Russians did not retaliate. Days after the inauguration, the Trump administration ordered State Department staffers to develop proposals for immediately revoking the economic and other sanctions imposed against Russia. Thankfully, these staffers alerted Congress, who took steps to codify the sanctions in a law passed in August of 2017. The attempt to, over the, the to overturn the sanctions was abandoned after Mr. Flynn's conversation was revealed and Mr. Flynn resigned. Carter Page has confirmed this meeting with top Moscow and Rosaneft officials, that company, corporation, and House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligent Testimony. It's all laid out. When Page was asked if a Rosneft executive had offered him a potential sale of significant percentage of Rosneft, Page said he may, he may have briefly mentioned it, unquote. Dossier claim on page 23, quote, 
finally speaking separately to the same compatriot, a senior Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, MFA, official reported that as a prophylactic measure, a leading Russian diplomat, Mikhail Kuligan, had been withdrawn from Russia, had been withdrawn from Washington, excuse me, at short notice because Moscow feared his heavy involvement in the U.S. presidential election operation, including the so-called veterans pensions ruse, which we reported previously in the dossier, would be exposed in the media. His, his replacement was Andrei Banderov. However, he was clean in this regard. The truth. Mikhail Kuligan is the head of the economic section at the Russian embassy. He returned to Russia in August 2016. The BBC would go on to report that United States officials in 2016 had identified Kuligan as a spy, that he was under surveillance, thus verifying this key claim in the dossier. Further reporting by McClatchy has claimed that the FBI was investigating whether Kuligan, Kaligan, played a role in the election interference. Mr. Speaker, these are facts. They just scratched the surface of what we're dealing with. This is what we know. Despite some opponents and opportunists and attempts, these facts are indisputable. I ask for unanimous consent to add the entire Trump-Russia dossier produced by Christopher Steele into the record so future generations will know the truth of how we got here today. Without objection. Mr. Chairman. Do you know how much time I have? The gentleman has 14 minutes it's remaining. I'm going to read a little bit more of the dossier. And I'm going to stay away from the scurrilous things that have been reported in the newspaper because they, to me, are just distractions from what we should be looking at. The mechanism, this is from the dossier, the mechanism for transmitting intelligence involves pension disbursements to Russian emigres living in the United States as cover using counselor offices in New York, Miami, and D.C. Suggestion from source close to Mr. Trump and Mr. Manafort that Republican campaign team happy to have Russia as a media boogeyman to mask more extensive corrupt business ties to China and other emerging countries. Speaking in confidence, to a compatriot in late July 2016. Source E, an ethnic Russian close associate of Republican U.S. presidential candidate Donald Trump, admitted that there was a well-developed conspiracy of cooperation between them and the Russian leadership. This was managed on the Trump side by the Republican candidate's campaign manager, Paul Manafort, who was using foreign policy advisor Carter Page, and others as intermediaries. The two sides had a mutual interest, of course, in defeating Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, whom President Putin apparently hated and feared. Inter alia, Source E acknowledged that the Russian regime had been behind the recent leak of embarrassing email messages emanating from the Democratic National Committee to that WikiLeaks platform. Attention, attention. Sorcy said he understood that the Republican candidate and his team were relatively relaxed about this because it deflected media and the Democrats' attention away from Trump's business dealings in China and other emerging markets. Uh, for the record, Mr. Chairman, and I will enter that in the record at the proper time, not this evening, we have a whole dossier, again, having nothing to do with this, of every deal that we know of uh, that the president and his team made in 52 foreign countries. That will be entered into the record. Finally, regarding Trump's claimed minimal investment profile in Russia, a separate source with direct knowledge said this had not been 
for want of trying. Trump's previous efforts had included exploring the real estate sector in St. Petersburg as well as Moscow. But in the end, Mr. Trump had had to settle for the use of extensive other services there from local prostitutes rather than business success. That's what the dossier says. Trump advisor Carter Page holds secret meetings in Moscow with Mr. Session and senior Kremlin international internal affairs official Devetskin. Session raises issues of future bilateral U.S.-Russian energy cooperation and associated lifting of Western sanctions against Russia over Ukraine. Page was noncommittal in response. Devetkin discusses the release of Russian dossier of Kompromat on Trump's opponent, Hillary Clinton, but also hints at Kremlin possession of such material on Mr. Trump. Kremlin, the Kremlin concerned that the political fallout from the DNC email hacking operation is spiraling out of control. Extreme nervousness among Trump's associates as a result of negative media attention accusations. Russians, meanwhile, are keen to cool situation, maintain plausible deniability of existing and ongoing pro-Trump and anti-Clinton operations. Therefore, unlikely to, to be any ratcheting them up, ratcheting up of defensive plays, offensive plays in the immediate future. A source close to the Trump campaign, however, confirms regular exchange with Kremlin has existed for at least eight years. I said five years before. Eight years, including intelligence fed back to Russia on the oligarchs' activities in the United States. Within the context, Putin's priority requirement has been for intelligence on the activities business, and otherwise in the U.S., of leading Russian oligarchs and their families. And his associates duly had obtained and supplied that information. Speaking in early August 2016, two well-placed and established Kremlin war sources outlined the divisions and backlash in Moscow arising from the leaking of Democratic National Committee, emails and wider pro-Trump operation being conducted in the United States. The head of presidential administration in Russia, Sergei Ivanov, was angry at the, recent return, at the recent turn of events. He believed the Kremlin team involved, led by presidential spokesman Dmitry Peskov, had gone too far in interfering in foreign affairs with their elephant in a China shop. Ivanov claimed always to have opposed the handling and exploitation of intelligence by the PR team. Following the backlash against such foreign interference in U.S. politics, Ivanov was advocating that the only sensible course of action now for the Russian leadership was to sit tight and to deny everything. And they did. Continuing on this theme, the source close to Ivanov reported that Peskov now was scared, I will not use the derogatory term, that he would be scapegoated by Putin and the Kremlin had held responsible for the backlash. And so, page after page, Mr. Ivanov appears, he's at the center of this, and if we know this, then Mr. Mueller knows this. And if we know this, Mr. Mueller knows more. So this is the dossier, which has been public now since early last year. And I wanted to bring this to the floor last year, but we chose to do it another way, if you remember, and trying to get the president's taxes made public. So I will conclude by this, Mr. Speaker. You've been patient. This is to me, a big deal. 83% of this dossier has been proven correct. 83. I did not use anything that was dubious of the 17%. And so I say to you, the Congress has a right as an equal branch of government 
to review what has happened so that our president, as Mr. Schwab said, Schaub said, head of ethics in the Ethics Commission, said to Mr. President Trump, what you need to do is cut yourself off from your assets. That's what you need to do. That's what you must do. And obviously, he did not do it. So there's a lot of material out there. Uh, going at, it, at this a year and a half is not a long time. You know how long uh, the Watergate took. But I would think that this is going to take longer than the Watergate. That's my opinion on some of these things which will have to be traced. Some people have been indicted. Some people are going to prison already. But I am telling you, the bulk of information is going to be laid out when Mr. Mueller is ready. Not when I'm ready or anybody in the chamber is ready. With that, I yield and I thank you. Members are rem reminded to refrain from engaging in personalities towards the president. That is, that is unacceptable. I did not engage in any personalities. I read from the record. I didn't call anybody a name. If I read it, it was somebody else that was writing it, not me. Remarks and debate in the House may not engage in personalities towards the president, whether originating as the member's own words or being reiterated from another source. The president is not above the law, sir. I am not above the law. Does the gentleman have a motion? I'm sorry? Does the gentleman have a motion? No, I don't have a motion. The gentleman is not recognized for a debate at this time. Well, can I have, want me to make a motion to extend? Is that what you're asking me to do? The chair would entertain a motion to adjourn at this time. Fine. You have it your way. I'll be back. The question.